This podcast is funded by Ted Dintersmith, the executive producer of the acclaimed film Most Likely to Succeed, and the author of the best-selling book What School Could Be. This is Josh Rapoon, host of the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. This series is committed to giving full voice to the innovative, creative, and imaginative educators and education leaders across the Hawaiian Islands. Our goal is a thousand points of light, and as we approach 27,000 downloads to date, the wind is fully in our sails. Speaking of a thousand points of light, my guest today is Kevin Matsunaga. Kevin never imagined he would follow in his father's footsteps and become a teacher. He found his calling as the digital media teacher at Chiefest Kamakahele Middle School on the island of Kauai and his students have won many national video competitions. In 2007, the Hawaii Department of Education recognized Kevin with a District Teacher of the Year Award. The impact he has had on kids in our public schools since 2007 is simply staggering. Kevin is always looking for ways to improve the things he's doing in his class and his teaching practice, and that involves a lot of extra time. Despite the long hours he puts in, Kevin returns year after year because he sees how much his teaching, guiding, coaching, and mentoring means to those under his tutelage. During this COVID-19 pandemic, Kevin's Advanced Media Level 2 class has continued to produce its morning announcement show each school day. The students all have equipment at home they can use or they are using their cell phones or personal cameras to record themselves. Some of his students have even started a podcast during this pandemic. You can listen to the Couch Pueo podcast by clicking on the link in our show notes. There is so much more to Kevin's story, so let's get this party started. Here is my conversation with Kevin Matsunaga. Kevin, welcome to the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. Thanks for having me. I mean, you've had such a great group of people. I'm just, I'm honored to be here. We have, yeah. It's been pretty awesome here here in the, yeah. the third season and such a great lineup. But I've really been yes. looking forward to talking to you today, Kevin. So thank you. So Kevin, any any internet investigation will reveal a great deal about your life. You were featured in PBS Hawaii's <laughs> Long Story Short. You're the focus of numerous articles, interviews, films, and newsletters over your career. Um, in our show notes, I will include links to all of these. But today, okay. I want to focus our conversation in some super specific areas that might prove useful to our educator and education leader listeners. Okay. So, but before we do that, I do want to ask you one personal question. Your dad was a school librarian. In in what ways, Kevin, yes. did his profession, if you will, end up shaping your life as you moved into adulthood and later a teaching career? Yeah, um, you know, because he was a school librarian, uh, he always brought home books for us to read. So for my brother and I, so he would anytime a new book would come in, you know, he'd bring it home to us first so that we could read it. And so he always, you know, emphasized this, uh, you know, this emphasis on literacy and reading. And, you know, he didn't force us to do it. He didn't make us, you know, read before we could go out to play or anything like that. But he just always made good books available. He was encouraging about it. And uh, I think that kind of started my interest, I guess, in, in, seeing that this, you know, could be something that that I might want to do. I mean, I really didn't see it at first. He was the first person that saw it in me. Mm. And, uh, but I think from those early, you know, years of him bringing home those books and, and just stressing that, I think that kind of helped start it. Mm. That's awesome. My father and my mother were, were very much um, book people and, and were always borrowing books. And so, my family life growing up was very much ar around books and about reading books, and they used to read out loud to us. So, yeah, I really identify yeah. with, with what that must have been like in your in your early life, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So, Kevin, um, in the past few years, quote, student voice has moved from one of many concepts in Hawaii public education to one of its three pillars, if you will. And by the way, the other two pillars are teacher collaboration and intentional school design. 
So your media students okay. produced um, the first ever segment almost 11 years ago in the first ever PBS Hawaii Hikino episode, which aired in prime time. This episode's team is made up of nine schools from four islands. From Kauai, there's Chief is Kamaka Hele Middle School. From Hawaii Island, Konawaina High School. On Oahu, Waipahu High School, Kamehameha Schools, Kapalama. Kuana Nakoa Middle School, Kalani High School, and Sacred Hearts Academy. From Maui, there's Maui High School, and of course, Maawana Intermediate. And so mm -hmm. your, your Chiefest Kamakahele Middle School Hikino team reported on a Kauai Island controversy known as the Friday Night Lights. So what was, yes. <laughs> what was that three minute segment about? And in what ways does it showcase what student voice is really all about? It, you know, that, that story was about uh, a controversy at the time in which, um, you know, we have these newel shearwaters on our island that are endangered, but they get disoriented at night uh, during their, their mating season, I guess, when they're trying to fly out from uh, the mountains out to the ocean. And when we have, you know, big bright lights from football stadiums uh, or even just traffic lights getting in their way, you know, um, they often will hit the poles and, you know, come crashing down and, you know, dogs might get them or anything. And so what happened was there was this push to save these birds. And that meant turning off the lights uh, on Friday nights when we have our, uh, you know, high school football games. And, and here in Kauai, there's not a lot to do, right? So football games and Friday nights during football season is a pretty, you know, important part of our community. And so there was a huge, you know, kind of back and forth controversy between, uh, you know, saving the birds and, and realizing that these are endangered species, uh, but then also recognizing that we're losing, you know, this tradition of Friday night lights. And so my students set out to cover that. So um, when we were working on this, uh, these, these news stories at the time, you know, Hikino had not started yet, but they were looking for you know, stories from your community. And so we just, you know, sat down as a class and, and just started talking about, you know, what were some of the things that might interest viewers from, you know, another island. Uh, and this was one of the ones that that came up right away in class. And so that's that's how it got started, you know, just from a discussion in class talking about what the students were talking about in their homes at uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the production of that piece, which is really, it's about three minutes long um, in the end, but in, in the production of that piece, you know, again, how, how did student voice emerge, the, 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 the definition of student voice, the actual development of student voice and how it plays out for them? Well, it's, you know, through that whole process of creating a new story, we're, we're always trying to teach them that they have to remain neutral, you know, and so... Mm -hmm. Um, it was it was tough because you know on some of them had like in fact one of the girls I think her brother played football you know their family was directly affected by it and so it's hard sometimes to separate how you feel about something versus trying to stay neutral and to present both sides to the issue and so for them you know student voice became about trying to maybe hold back on some of the things that they, you know, felt strongly about to try to see the other side of something because there are two sides to every story, right? And so they kind of had to, you know, kind of sit back and try to look at the problem from both sides, speaking to experts on both sides and speaking to community members and try to paint this picture of, you know, here's the problem, here's why it's happening, here's how it's affecting our community. And, you know, here's how our, uh, the community feels about it. And then what happens next? And so, um, you know, for them, it was, I think it was just trying to figure out, hey, we gotta, we can't just only look at what we want to talk about. We have to be sure to cover the other side as well. Mm. I think that's so interesting, Kevin. You know, I, I interviewed Robert Pennybacker, who's the driving force behind um, Hiki No uh, at PBS Hawaii. And one of the things that we talked about in that episode was this notion of the balance of journalism, that as a journalist, you really are, yeah. right? You're driven to be balanced. And, and when you think about student voice, 
I don't know, maybe we're at a place where it's like, well, whatever I have to say, I'm just going to put it out there. Um, <laughs> but it's the modulation. Yeah. It's, the, it's the balancing of your voice, which sometimes means keeping quiet and listening and observing, right? And it sounds like that's yeah. what the kids were experiencing almost 11 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think if, you know, a lot of people took on that notion of, hey, I need, let's listen first, mm. you know, maybe we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in, in a lot of, uh, a lot of instances um, in, in society right now. And so, yeah, for them, they had to, you know, really take a step back, talk mm. to both sides and try to present it as evenly as possible to stand them in the middle of that fence and yeah. let the viewer you know, after watching the piece, decide where they want to end up on. Mm. And also, Kevin, I would be remiss if if I left this question without having you tell um, the story of when the lights actually went out and your team was on the oh, field. Yeah. That's a great story. We would love to hear it. Yeah. So, you know, the the as the kids were getting ready to get some B-roll of one of the last maybe, you know, night games we had left, I didn't think we had too many. Uh, because there was a certain cutoff in which they were going to, you know, start turning off the lights and they were going to switch to Saturday games. So we only had, you know, maybe one or two games left. And it just so happened that the week that they wanted to film, I was on uh, another island. I was with our Hawaii creative media team uh, to do some sort of a workshop and we were on the big island. And so I was communicating via cell phone and text message with my students uh, that night who were, you know, they were trying to get some bureau. So they had gone down there with their parents and they had gotten shots of the game at night and of the crowds and, you know, the field. And one of the shots, you know, in our pre-production, we, you know, we thought, wow, it'd be really cool for us to have a shot of the lights going off. You wow. Know, not just fade to fade to black, right? That you could do in post, but actually, you know, have the camera set up on the field and then the lights get ceremoniously turned off, maybe right. for good, right? And so we were able to get that shot and it really, you know, made a big difference in the story. Wow, it's that's such a dramatic moment. Yeah. Wow, I mean, I'm getting chicken skin here just thinking about, you know, them on the field with the cameras rolling and then the lights go out in that moment. Wow. Yeah, that's... and the funny thing was, you know, when it was done, they were like, okay, we're, we're in the dark now. How do we get out? <laughs> right. <laughs> they, they had forgotten about like, okay, how do we, we don't have a flashlight. <laughs> right, right. So it was kind of funny to hear them try to have to scramble to find their parents after that in the dark. Yeah, that's a great story. So, um, Kevin, in previous episodes, I've talked with a number of middle school educators and education leaders, and all of them, without fail, talk about middle school as being a wondrously complex and sometimes painful bubbling <laughs> stew oh, yeah. of physical growth and emotional and intellectual development. So what examples can you give us from your work as an educator that directly or indirectly address these physical and emotional complexities of, of middle schools. In other words, you, you built these projects or these, these you know, um, examples of student learning because you knew your adolescent audience well. Yeah, you know, there, I don't think there's any other place like it. You know, middle school definitely is a place for all of that. You see so much change in those three years from the students. They come in and they're 11 years old. Some of them weigh like maybe 60 pounds and mm. they are tiny little things. And, you know, in three years, it's amazing how how much they grow and develop and, and just, you know, learn uh, in that short time. And so for us in our program, the way that I set it up was I always tried to make sure that I had sixth graders in our advanced program. And so in the beginning, I would have a system in which, you know, kids would apply and we'd accept sixth graders, you know, brand new to the school, right, right into our advanced program from day one. And, and it was really great because I could potentially have them for three years. Mm -hmm. And by the time they got to be, you know, an eighth grader, um, just to see how much progress they made was just amazing. I had, I remember this one girl that when she came into our program as a sixth grader, could barely talk to anyone, super shy, um, not willing to to really step up and take any sort of lead in anything, just willing to kind of be there, um, dealing with, you know, a little bit of anxiety issues as well, just coming into a big school. 
And, um, you know, by the time she left, uh, she was actually, inter- you know, interviewed in that Aloha Atlanta mm-hmm. uh, piece and how she spoke so eloquently about her experience was just, was amazing. And it was so incredible to see, you know, the change in this, this one student throughout those three years to go from someone who barely spoke a word all the way up to this, this person that could just was willing to, you know, speak in front of the camera and could speak so well and clearly mm-hmm. about her experiences. It was pretty awesome to see. So it's just, it's super interesting to me, Kevin, that, you know, in in one case, you might be a middle school teacher who knows that the kids are kind of going through this remarkable experience of emotional mm-hmm. and physical growth, um, but all you're doing is really observing it as you take them through an academic program. And then the other cases where you actually begin to develop your program to help address this growth and to ease them yeah. through the process. And it sounds like that's what happens in your program. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, because, you know, when they would come in as sixth graders, I always would pair them up with a returning student, yeah. you know, so they would be um, mentored by either a seventh or an eighth grader. And, you know, the purpose of that was to, you know, help them ease in that transition because, you know, they're coming from maybe some, sometimes even a school that had no media program and then they're coming in and they're getting thrown into the fire and we're doing all these things. And so they need somebody that is more at their level that can be their guide. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I set up my program is I had, I paired every kid up with somebody else and I always tried to make sure that our new students had a return need to, to, fall back on. Mm. And then those students in turn then became a mentor for someone else. So, you know, talk about being able to to kind of work on those skills as those kids progressed. Um, you know, that's exactly what we did. Yeah, that's a that's really cool, Kevin. I mean, I, we're going to talk about Aloha Atlanta, the film at the end of the conversation today. But I remember that one of the things that really jumped out at me when I first watched that film was your your stories about how you paired up the kids and how you developed that mentoring and how much that meant to them mm-hmm. in terms of their yeah. emotional and physical and intellectual growth um, as they mm-hmm. move as they move through the program. So speaking of skills, um, a, a journalist for the Garden Isle uh, Kauai newspaper asked you what accomplishments you were most proud of. And I found your answer, Kevin, super fascinating, in part because you listed the development of several key skills or what folks these days might call essential skills or durable skills. You cited being a good team member, meeting deadlines, and communicating clearly. So I have a couple questions about this. So I was a history teacher and we love change over time questions, right? So um, (laughs) have these three skills always been important or have they become more important over the last few decades? And if yes, why do you think? Um, it's hard for me to say that it's it's more important. I guess those those are just key skills. I think that any anyone needs, um, you know, despite whatever field you go into, right? And and for our program, we've never tried to produce like the next Spielberg or George Lucas or anything like that. Um, we our program exists to give kids opportunities that. Uh, fall along their their interests and their interests will change you know just because they're interested in media in middle school doesn't mean they're going to continue in that field right uh, throughout high school and so our goal is to just prepare them to be better adults and to be successful in whatever career that they decide to do so when kids come back and you know people ask me well you know how many of your kids are in hollywood or you know things like that and and to me that's not important we do have some kids that that will go on and we'll be, you know, we'll have careers in the industry. Um, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to just provide, you know, opportunities for these kids to explore this interest that they have now. And, you know, because knowing full well that it, it may change, we just want them to be able to be, you know, prepared in any field that they go into um, after us. And so that's our measure of success. It's not about, you know, how many kids we have in Hollywood. You know, mm-hmm. it's about just kids that are that are able to succeed in any field that they do and i guess you know if i guess if we're looking at the last you know 5 or or, or 10 years is it more important to be a better team member I, yeah and and communicate i think so you know yeah i think so 
Yeah, I think that that's the national global conversation now is that yeah. <laughs> as this so-called age of acceleration continues to accelerate, these three qualities yeah. are becoming more and more important. But yet this is something that you have been emphasizing from the very beginning. So it's not like yeah. you're playing catch up. You, you're actually ahead of the game in that sense, right? Yeah, I, I guess so. And, and we've never looked at it that way. We've, you know, I've just tried to look at it as like, you know, how would I want my kids to mm -hmm. come out, you know, when they've gone through our program. And, I, and I've been fortunate to have that. I've had all three of my children be able to be part of my program. And those are years that I cherished. And, and I just absolutely enjoyed, you know, having my kids participate in that. But that's kind of like what I wanted. I wanted them to be able to be successful and be able to communicate with people and to be able to meet their deadlines and, yeah. and just cooperate with each other. And that we've, we've pushed that every year since the, the very beginning. So I want to I want to drill down just a little bit more on the skills thing. Um, I'd love to hear how kids participating in, for example, the Student News Network program or PBS Hawaii's Hiki No Student News program develop these specific skills. Like, what are your methods, your practices, Kevin, your approaches that help kids gain these three skills that we talked about about good being a good team member, meeting deadlines, and mm -hmm. communicating clearly. Well, it starts with just having activities that will reinforce that. So, you know, because we're we're involved with PBS Hawaii, first and foremost with their Hikino program, you know, they, whenever we're approached for stories, there's always deadlines. And so that's something that in all of our projects, and regardless of whether it's for Hikino or for anything else, if we have a project, we always set clear deadlines and we always make sure that there's, you know, ample time for students to be able to complete their their tasks whether it's creating a short 30 second psa or creating a three minute news story so mm -hmm. we build in the time um, based on the project but we make sure that there's time but we hold them to that deadline because you know part of being responsible is is you know making sure that you're doing what you need to do if you're working with other people on a team that if you have things that you're responsible for that you're doing it because it supports the entire team. And so because we have, you know, students that work with partners, uh, because when we practice for STN and we're practicing for competitions, we're in teams of, you know, four or possibly eight, you know, there's always this sense of, you know, you are part of a team and everybody needs to contribute because if someone doesn't, we're all going to have to help pick up the slack. And, and so, you know, being responsible with your deadlines kind of helps make the whole thing run more smoothly. And so for every assignment that we do, there's deadlines, you know, and so we're always, we're always in reinforcing that in, in pretty much every project that we take on. Mm -hmm. You know, I interviewed one um, head of a charter school here on Oahu, and she talked about how what you value is where you spend your time. So if you value good team members and meeting deadlines, or and mm -hmm. and communicating clearly, then you have to spend the time yeah. doing those things, right? It's a training process. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just another thing that we we were doing for probably about ten years is our students were on the radio for uh, a local radio station called FM ninety seven, where we were producing uh, a two minute piece every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday that talked about anything happening in any Koi school, public or private. And so we were held to that deadline as well. Like, you know, hey, we got to get wow. their, these audio files out to them by a certain time. And so this means we have to start on scripts at this time. We got to do research by, by then. We then have to start recording by, you know, so everything, <laughs> everything we did is, you know, definitely tied to teamwork, responsibility, meeting deadlines, and then, you know, trying to do your best. And communicating clearly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely. awesome. You know, Kevin, when I, when I was in middle school, I actually dreamed of having a, a, a radio show. Um, and you and I were exchanging texts today and I was bemoaning the fact that my middle school experience was so lame and I never got these kinds of opportunities <laughs> that your kids are having. No technology back <clears throat> then, right? Yeah. And I just, I just really wanted that late night FM radio, you know, jazz yeah. show. And I, I felt like I had the voice for it and all that, but, um, mm -hmm. but here I am, uh, you know, host of a podcast. So what the heck, you know, it happens yeah. at some point. That's great. Yep. So, Hey everyone, stay with us after this short break, we will continue our conversation with Kevin Matsunaga. Hi friends. Toy Hirschman here from the Entre Ed Talk podcast. 
I am super excited to support the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast hosted by none other than the amazing Josh Rapoon. And I also want to give a big shout out to all of the incredible educators in Hawaii who are doing unreal things in the entrepreneurship and design-based thinking spaces. I hope you all subscribe and listen to What School Could Be in Hawaii. And also, hey, why not check out the EntreEd Talk podcast where we interview stellar entrepreneurial educators and entrepreneurs from across the country and globe. I cannot wait to connect with you. Aloha, my name is Aaron Shorn, a previous guest on this very podcast. I am also now head of growth and community at Hawaii's own Unruler. Unruler is a collaborative mobile and web platform that accelerates innovation, grows culture and community, and celebrates learning. Learners post multimedia, tag their learning, and through comments are able to work together asynchronously. Each post is a moment of learning that forms the foundation of a joyous learning journey. We can be found at UNR. ULR.com. Mahalo. Hey everyone, this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast, and we are back with Kevin Matsunaga, a media teacher, mentor, coach, and guide at Chiefess Kamakahele Middle School on the island of Kauai. So, Kevin, in this section, I want to ask you to describe briefly a bunch of projects you and your kids have been involved in that might spark our listeners' curiosity and wonder. So, okay. here we go. Um, so, your chiefest Kamakahele Middle School students produce a daily TV news broadcast. What is yes. the value to your entire school community of these broadcasts they produce each day? Like, what does the greater school community gain when they watch these productions? Our shows are short. They're, they're, they're created each day. We create them uh, ahead of time for playback uh, in the morning homeroom uh, every day. And they provide pertinent information for that particular school day. So, you know, what schedule we're on, um, what lunch, what's for lunch, uh, what meetings might be happening at recess for clubs, uh, whether or not there's any activities happening uh, that day out in the courtyard, uh, if we're having any sort of sports activities at recess. Uh, and then we're also sharing reminders to students about things like, you know, wearing your mask properly and picking up after yourself and things like that. So on the, on the surface level, it's, it's providing these, these, you know, these daily reminders and important information for students for that particular day. And yet your community must be looking at the TV and feeling something. What do you, what do you think they're feeling? I know that sounds wacky to ask that, but what do you think they're feeling? You know, I'm, I'm hoping that they're feeling that they're, they're proud of, of the, the work that our students are doing. I know we've gotten a lot of uh, positive comments. We just started them back up. We had actually, we, we were doing a live show every single day from the moment we opened our school in 2000. Wow. And so when I got hired there, when we opened Chief Kamakahele in 2000, my principal at the time was like, hey, I want, this is going to be our tech school for the island. I want a morning announcement show. Can you do it? And at the time, I had not done it, <laughs> but I said, yes, I can. <laughs> and then I had to go figure it out after that. Right. <laughs> Right. I tell that story and she cringes and she's like, what? I didn't know that. So yeah, so we had to figure it out. So we, you know, we produce this, this live show every day. And so it's just something that, that I think, um, you know, the kids, we, we ask for participation students, we'll get kids out to do man on the street type things. We do a photo of the day where kids can send in their photo to be featured on the show. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that, you know, kids are seeing this and they're, they're entertained. They're, they're getting that information. They're looking forward to it. And the feedback that we've, you know, received since we started it back up in November has been very positive. Yeah. And I think that it's a marketing tool for your program, right? Because they look at it and they go, hmm, yeah. that looks interesting. Yeah. I'd love to participate. So yeah. take media next year and then you can help do the announcements. <laughs> there you go. Right. So Kevin, what is Lihui Loop? How does it, how does it work? And in what ways were your students involved? So Lihui Loop is an audio tour. It's a, it's a one mile walking audio tour in Lihue. And um, we were approached um, by a committee uh, probably back in January or February of, of this uh, past year. And what they were looking for 
was they wanted us to submit a proposal to create these audio segments for this tour. So there were, I believe, I think 16 or 19 stops. I can't remember if it was 16 or 19, but there were you know, a number of, of stops along the way. And the idea behind it was they were going to have these medallions that would have QR codes on it. And so then someone walking you know, the loop could take their phone out, point their camera at the QR code, and it would bring up an audio file that shared a story about that particular location. And so they asked us to submit a proposal. And I said, yeah, we could. This is something that our kids can do. We've been on the radio. They know how to do audio files. It's not a problem. And so we, we submitted a proposal and then we were accepted. And so we worked with um, their team. And uh, the high school, Kauai High School's STEM program, uh, created the medallion. So they did the 3D printing of all the medallions and they were partners in the project. And my students were then uh, tasked with creating all of these audio uh, stories that matched this tour along the way. And so what they had to do was we, we broke them up into teams because I love teams, right? Mm-hmm. And then we uh, went ahead and assigned them a point or I, actually I, I asked them to go and, you know, here are all the points Tell me which one you interests you the most. And we tried to, to let them choose which one they, they wanted. And eventually everyone settled on a, on a point of interest. And then they then had to do some research. And so we were lucky because uh, a local author had written a story, you know, a book about Lihue. And she was willing to then, um, you know, gift us the book where we based a lot of our research on. But then students also had to, you know, talk to different family members. We had one student that um, talked about an old theater on Rice Street. Mm. And uh, she actually was able to interview her grandmother because her grandparents went on dates at that theater wow. way back when. And wow. so that was that was really cool. <laughs> like, you know, like how else would we have gotten that? Right. Yes. Right. And so so yeah, so our students had to create these these stories. They had to do the research, then write all these scripts that we then had to also get approved uh, from our experts that were in the community. So they there was a lot of communication between our experts back and forth with our students, you know, revising and rewriting mm. and and going back and forth. And then they had to record um, their story. And some of them actually even put in sound effects and they they added things to it that um, it's just this this awesome mm-hmm. experience. So if you're ever on Kauai, it's called the Lihui Loop. There's a website, you can go check it out and mm-hmm. you can just walk. It's just, it's just a one mile loop around Lihui. It's right, it walks right around Wilcox Elementary School and takes you to different places. And you can just you know bring some headphones and, and listen to all of these Pretty awesome stories that are that's told to you by our students. Aloha and welcome to Point 19 on the Lihui Loop audio tour. This is the Royal Theater, which was built in 1940. This is Malia Miyazaki from the Chiefest Kamakahele Middle School Advanced Media Productions class, and I will be sharing with you the story about this theater on Rice Street. The theater never had a premiere movie status. The theater ran Japanese language films on Tuesday and Thursday nights and family fair the rest of the week. Events like high school graduations were also held there. My grandparents used to go there for dates. I was telling Mali was when her grandpa asked me out for a date. First time I'd been there, I, thinking back, I kind of remember a booth, a ticket booth that was separated from the front part of the building. The way we dressed was we dressed well, no no play clothes, no t-shirts. I remember um, grandpa wore long pants and a nice shirt. And I remember wearing clothes, like clothes that I would wear to work. When you get into the theater, the chairs were arranged so that the better seats were located at the top. And if you go further down, the chairs were wooden. The Kawakami family now owns the building and is holding on to the property for memories. The building holds several businesses, such as a barber shop and office spaces. Currently, there are no other plans for this building. Thank you for learning about the Royal Theater, and I hope that you have an amazing day and have fun on the rest of the Lihui Loop audio tour. That's it. You are now back to where you started, near Kalana Park. Thank you for joining us on the Lihui Loop walking audio tour. Have a great rest of your day!
That's just a brilliant project, Kevin. And, you know, it's so replicable. It could happen in almost any city, oh, yeah. anywhere here in Absolutely. Hawaii or on the mainland or in the world, really. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Any small town could do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And all the resources are there and all of the elements of that sort of interdisciplinary learning are there in yes. the project. Yeah, that's very cool. Absolutely. So kind of along the same lines, back in 2017 in an interview, you mentioned that your students were managing the social media for an organization called Kauai Grown. So what is yes. this project and what is the scope of work? And in what ways are your students learning professional social media skills? Well, what happened was that, you know, through the work that our students have done over the years, um, you know, our, our program uh, made a name for itself in the community. And so we would never have a shortage of, of groups or organizations or people, you know, contacting us to see if they if we could do something with them. And so, yeah, we got a call from someone from um, the, the Farm Bureau and was, you know, they said, hey, like, you know, we, we saw the work that your students are doing. Um, would you guys be willing to work with us to create uh, the social media posts for this Kauai Grown program? And, and, and the Kauai Grown program uh, promotes locally uh, local businesses, uh, whether they are a farm or a company using you know locally made products, uh, you know to help these these businesses and farmers with getting their products out and and people getting to know them and so um, we said sure let us let us see if we can you know take a crack at it and so we came up with a proposal and um, yeah we were basically you know um, asked to to then create the Facebook uh, account the Twitter account and the Instagram account for the Kauai Grown program. Wow. And our students managed all three of them for about two and a half years to three years mm -hmm. uh, before we just recently gave that back up uh, once the pandemic hit. Mm, got it. And, you know, Ted Dintersmith in his book, What School Could Be, talks about an Albuquerque high school in New Mexico that partnered with a local regional soccer team that was struggling with its social media and these kids mm -hmm. just knocked it out of the park. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, they raised attendance at the games and the whole nine yards. So that, again, it's such real world learning, right? When you do things like that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because, you know, here for, to, you know, just to manage all of those accounts, we have to set up a, a system in which, yeah. you know, we had to create teams again, you know, teams that we had, you know, for let's say photographers that would, would go out to a farmer's market and calf photos of these different, you know, organizations and businesses or, or or farmers that would then bring that those photos back, edit them, get them in a folder where then a post writer would then take that photo, do some research on the business or farm, and then write, you know, a short post highlighting, you know, what was in the photo or highlighting the business. And then that post then had to be, you know, I had to proof it before it went out. Right. And then we had some, we had a student involved that had to then was responsible for actually making the post, you know. So they actually, I had students that were the the, the people in charge of sending out these posts. So it was it was a huge, you know, responsibility and trust that the organization had in our students to let students, you know, be responsible to po put these things out, but. You know the kids. That's that's what they know, right? They're they're just they've been surrounded by technology, right, uh, wow. for so long that it it wasn't something that was was difficult for them. And so, yeah, we we it was a lot of work though. It was a lot of stress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, um, yeah. But again, team, sure. teamwork, deadlines, and communication. I mean, it's just Absolutely. so consistent, right? So, yeah. Kevin, your students during the pandemic designed, developed, and produced the Couch Pueo podcast. And Pueo yeah. is owl in Hawaiian for those who are listening to this podcast from outside of Hawaii. So That's I, our was, mascot. <clears throat> I was like, wow, like, what is this all about? So what is it all mm -hmm. about? Yeah, well, we had, you know, when, when podcasts started to gain in popularity, the, actually the year before we had ideas about starting our own student podcast. And we had some students that were interested in the fourth quarter, you know, that wanted to try some stuff. So we had, we, we were able to kind of put together a couple of episodes, but we never really posted anything. And um, it was more, more my fault than the kid's fault, because at that time I wasn't really familiar with, okay, you know, how do you, 
How do you publish a podcast? Um, where mm-hmm. do you have to put it? And how does it get published? And where, what about the artwork and all this kind of stuff? And so, you know, I was having to learn those things as they were learning. Like, you know, how do I how do I do this? And so, I wasn't quite comfortable with with what I needed to do. And so, you know, we had only we had produced like one episode. You know, we were working on another, and then the school year ended. We didn't really do anything with them, and then. You know, when the next year came out, we, you know, we wanted to go do it again, but we were kind of saving that again for maybe later in the year. And then when the uh, pandemic hit, we were like, you know, what can we do to give the kids something to do at, at home that, you know, is not going to bore them to death and is not going to give them, you know, worksheets or different, you know, busy work. What can we do that they're going to have some fun with that they can actually learn about? And so we said, let's let's start up the podcast and let's do it. Let's let's get it out there. And so we we formed a team. Uh, we had we actually had a group of girls. Uh, I think t- two or three different sets of of students that that worked on it together. And basically, they came up with their you know with their own topics, what they wanted to talk about. And I just let them go. And so we we met over um, you know Google Meets and Zoom. And we kind of worked uh, remotely, but you know, I had them come up with a, a brief outline of like what the show would be about. I didn't want them scripting anything because, you know, mm. podcasts are usually not scripted. You know, they're just you know people just talking. And so I said, okay, let's let's at least have, you know, talking points. Let's come out with an outline so at least you know we know there's going to be talking happening. And then you know we we designated one person to be the leader so that if you know talking stopped. And there was that awkward pause. That person jumped in, kind of pushed the conversation ahead. And so, yeah, we did that, and and we that's how we spent that that last quarter of, of the school year. And that when we were all locked down, producing, I think they produced like six episodes of this podcast. Wow, that's so cool. And what what's like the content of the podcast? You know, <laughs> it was. I I can say that it was the best content. There there were one episode was like how the celebrities are helping with the you know the pandemic. So it wasn't like okay. it wasn't that wasn't you know something that was like the probably our best episode. But they talked about you know in other episodes they talked about how students were feeling, you know what their feelings were like, and you know being stuck at home and not being able to come into school and the fears that they had. And so mm. it was actually a really good like you know, kind of like a time capsule that we were able to capture of how students were dealing with everything at that time. You know, so some episodes were like that, not all of them. You know, we had the celebrity one, but, you know, most of the episodes were all tied around things like that. Like, what are people doing? How can we be safe? And and so I I think it was just, it's just a great look into how people were feeling, how the kids were, were, are at that time. Yeah, that's great. So, Kevin, a couple more questions in this greatest hits section, and then we'll take another break. So, um, recently, you and an educator on Maui named Nicole were featured in the new Educators Edge podcast, a locally grown yeah. series by and about public school educators. And you two talked about the value of using podcasts as a way to help students find their voices. So, my question yeah. is why do middle school students struggle when the moment arrives to hit record and talk like what's happening in that moment part of it is they're not used to to having you know the voice or that people or the idea that people want to hear what they want to have to say you know a lot of times middle school kids they're looked at as like you know they're they're so moody they're so emotional they're going through all these changes what could a middle schooler say that i would want to listen to you know so a lot of times i think they they come in with with kind of like that attitude like you know who wants to listen to me you know yeah. but when you open up this this idea of a podcast that anyone can listen to it and that you can talk about anything that you want to that i think then in turn kind of turns something in them that where they can now begin to see that hey like what we have to say maybe people want to listen to it and that's exactly like how you know we saw you know, Hiki No and the Student Television Network and the stories that we were doing. It, right. was, it was the same thing. You know, in the beginning, we struggled with, you know, what would the kids were like, why would they want to listen to us? And then then it became, oh, they really want to know what you want to know about, what, yeah. what you guys yeah. think about, you know? And so, yeah, I think that's what the podcast bring about. 
You know, you shared the the ten year anniversary video um, about Hikino, and Kevin, I, I literally almost fell out of my chair when I was listening to these kids. Ten years, they're now in their, yeah. their early twenties, right? And you yeah. you just you just marvel at their voice that how how strong and clear their voices are, um, and and that's growth over time, and that's something that you work yeah. on every day, right? Relentlessly, you Absolutely. work on Absolutely. And none of them are in media. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. None of them went into Hollywood. None of them went into that that field. They're all successful in in different areas, you know? And it's yeah. just yeah, it's it's so awesome to see them just be successful, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 be able to be confident and to look back on that time mm-hmm. um and and to see that, you know, hey, that was kind of cool that we were involved in something that you know, no one had really known about before. No one knew what it was going to be about. And then yet we did it. Yeah. And then here we are. It's still going 10 years later. Right, you know? right. Yeah, there was a social worker, a researcher, a teacher. Yeah, you know, it was just mm-hmm. amazing to look at, at where they are at this yeah. particular point in time. It was really cool to see their progress. Yeah. So, Kevin, you shared with me the Chiefess Kamakaheli Middle School media program site Vimeo page. And I watched yeah. a bunch of the short videos produced by your students. And one of them about an artist, a painter on Kauai, yeah. stopped me in my tracks. His name is Moses Hamilton. And your students' yeah. uh, news story about his being paralyzed in an accident and then becoming an artist, a painter was wonderful. So here's my question about this. This is an assessment question. So once this production is is done, how do you evaluate and report out on her? It was a a young woman who did this particular segment on your students' work to your school and and to her parents, to parents in general. Like what Mm -hmm. what is an authentic assessment in this process that you've developed in your practice? There are several different parts of that, right? The first one, obviously, is the technical part, right? What can the student do with the technology, with the camera, with the microphone, uh, to be able to tell a story like that? You know, and you, if you look at that that story, they got some amazing shots. They got you know close ups, and they they got uh, the interview done well, and just you know technically, everything was just sound in that in that story, mm-hmm. um, and. It wasn't, you know, th- that was like the final version, right? Through the Hikino process, we learn that there are several revisions and and, and it takes a while for students to get there. And so, um, but, you know, in, in the technical part of it, that's one thing I think that our kids really excel at because we just have so many opportunities to practice that. And right. so, for one, the easy thing to look at is, is, the, is the technical part. And then the other part we're looking at is, you know, how are they with telling a story? Right. You know, are they are they able to to ask questions that can can pull the story out of someone? Are they then able to take those answers and craft a script that that gives us a true beginning, middle, and ending? And and that is is another part that I would you know have parents look at look at their writing because the kids are doing the writing like I don't write any of their stuff for them mm-hmm. when when they're working on a story like that they come up with um, you know the first of all the topic you know why they think this could be good and then once that's approved they go out and they talk to this person they do the interview and then they come back and you know what the story might change because now they've had a chance to interview that person. Maybe, maybe, maybe what they thought was a story now is not. It's something totally different. Right. And so they then have to take that information, synthesize it, put it together, and then have something that you know makes sense and yeah. that people can connect with. And yeah, they they knocked that out of the park. That yeah. was like such a great story. They sure did, and and they they really humanized Moses Hamilton. I mean, you you don't come away from that piece feeling pity. Or even yeah, sympathy for exactly. him. You just you you yeah. you come away admiring him and his fortitude, yeah. his resilience, his determination, and um, that's just not easy to do when you're a young storyteller. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and they don't always realize that. You know, those things sometimes will come 
you know, after the fact where we're, we're looking at the piece when it's done and then we're like, Hey, did you realize that you, this is what came out or this is what, this is how you, you got this thing, you know, for us to see. And, and they're, they're pretty stoked when, when that happens, when, you know, these things happen and, you know, they're not necessarily always trying for that, but it's just because, you know, they've done such a good job in, you know, asking the questions and putting together, a, you know, a thoughtful story that that stuff comes out. So it's yeah. pretty cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, everyone, stay with us. We will continue our conversation with Kevin Matsunaga in just a moment. This is Guy Kawasaki. If you want to learn how to be a remarkable person, please check out my podcast, Remarkable People. I interview people like Roy Yamaguchi, Margaret Atwood, Jane Goodall, Stephen Wolfram, Stephen Pinker, Ariana Huffington, and Steve Wozniak. The point of the podcast is to help you become a little bit more remarkable. To learn more, go to remarkablepeople.com. Thank you. Hey everyone, this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast, and we are back with Kevin Matsunaga, a media productions teacher at Chiefus Kamakahele Middle School, who inspires young learners to follow their dreams. So Kevin, in this final section of our conversation, I want to focus on a beautiful short film produced by PBS Hawaii entitled Aloha Atlanta. Our mm -hmm. listeners can watch the entire film via a link that I'll put in the show notes. So I want to ask you a couple of quote unquote behind the scenes questions, if you will. Yeah. So in short, Aloha Atlanta tells the story of students who took to Atlanta to compete in the 2016 student television network competition. Kids are given thematic prompts and very short deadlines to produce news stories, which are then judged. So here's my here's my first question. Kevin, whether it's robotics or space camps or student TV news, I marvel at the way teachers and coaches like you astutely know when to step back and let the kids reach for specific standards and stand up to tough deadlines. So to what extent was this astuteness already part of your DNA? And to what extent was it something you had to train for or be trained for? Oh, that's a, that's a great question because that definitely was something that I had to learn hmm. and, and train myself on. Because uh, I remember when I first started teaching, I was uh, I taught uh, fifth and sixth grade at Lelihua Elementary School in Pearl City. And we would take our kids to the um, Onizuka Center. They have, it's sort of like a space camp, but they created these sort of like space exploration programs in schools all across the country. And so basically what would happen is you would, you would sign up for this program, you would work with your students. Well, you'd have to get trained first and then you, as a teacher, and then you'd, you'd take this curriculum, you'd bring it back to your school, and then you'd have to work with your students where they would have specific jobs on the, the space shuttle and the space station. Mm -hmm. And they would have you know, different activities for you to do. And then you would go to this school that they outfitted to look just like um, a space center and, you know, with mission control and, uh, and a space shuttle. And your kids would actually participate in a mission. And then halfway through, they would switch places so that they were able to experience both sides. Mm -hmm. And I remember the, the, you know, in the beginning when I would take my kids, you know, I, I just wanted them to succeed. You know, in my eyes, if they didn't succeed, it wasn't a good experience. And so I would, I would be in the space shuttle with them and I'd be looking at what they were, I would be watching what they would be doing. And if they were doing something wrong, I would go and I would kind of help them. I would like tell them, oh, you might want to look at this or whatever. And one of the instructors at the site was like, Mr. Masanaga, you need to sit down. You need to sit down and <laughs> let them go. You need to let them fail if that's what it if that's what it takes, you know? Yeah. And I had to learn that because, you know, when I first started teaching, I all I thought was I just want them to succeed because I want them to feel good, you know, and I didn't see the value in failure, right? I didn't I didn't see the lessons that failure could teach you. And so I had to learn that. And that, you know, that experience going to that space center was just that started mm to open my eyes and see like, you know, yeah, I got to let them fail. And, and failing is, is okay. You know, you just learn from mistakes. Mm -hmm. 
so that you don't make them again and then you're better the next time and i and i had to learn that that was not something that came mm -hmm. you know naturally for me you know the the question came up for me because um the first episode of this season i did with edna hussey who's the elementary school principal at mid pacific institute here on oahu and we were talking kevin about you know how you know, the balance between hiring for certain practices in teachers and training teachers to develop certain mm -hmm. practices and she brought up this phrase of the astuteness of stepping back and uh you know i hadn't actually heard it phrased quite like that before so that's mm -hmm. why that's why it came up i was just like wow that's such an interesting thing like you know is it really you or is it something that you really have to train for and it sounds yeah, like that's yeah. something that you really have to train for, right? Absolutely. And and even when we take our students to these competitions, you know, winning is nice. Like I don't get me wrong. Like we love it when our students win, right? They're so excited. We see how much it boosts their confidence and they feel so good that their work is their hard work is being rewarded. But that is never our 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 end goal. Like, yeah. you know, when whenever we're ready for a competition, whenever we're practicing our goal is to finish and do the best we can. And then we leave it up to the judges. And if and if they see something that they like, hey, we'll be lucky. We, we might walk away with something. And if they don't, they don't. But our goal is to finish, make that deadline, and do the best that we can. And sometimes that, you know, it doesn't always work. Yeah. But as long as we can we can do our best and and try our hardest and then, you know, learn from the experience, that's how you succeed. You yeah, know? Truly that, important. that's how it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, Kevin. So, kind of along the same lines, like, and and many of our listeners have seen Ted Dindersmith's film, most likely to succeed. And I know it's been a long time since you've seen it, but um, among other storylines in that film, uh, there's one that depicts how a kid named Brian failed to complete a project, and in the process, mm -hmm. which is all very visible in the film in this public exhibition of learning, he alienates his project teammates. Though he does kind of emerge as a hero of sorts because he he completes the project during the following summer. Right. But my question to you is, you know, again, back to Aloha Atlanta is like, were there moments when a student really failed to meet a standard or a deadline? And if yes, like, what is your advice to fellow educators about how to handle such situations? Yeah. Oh, I got a good example for that. <laughs> I, I have many. I have many. We, you know, despite the awards that we've won, we have we've failed a lot in 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 our in our time. Um, but one that comes to mind is so in Aloha Atlanta, one of the storylines is this contest called the Crazy Eights. Uh, it used to be called the Sweet Sixteen. It started as a sixteen-hour competition in which teams, your whole class, could work on this one thing. And it's either creating a show, a new show, or creating a short film in a matter of 16 hours. And then they, they have since cut it down to eight hours. But basically, it's it's the most fun competition. It's the most stressful competition, but it's also the most rewarding. And so, you know, imagine a ballroom of, you know, 2,000 kids. And on every table is a team. And every team has the same deadline, you know, whether it's four or five o'clock in the afternoon, whatever it is. And every team is has been working all day on their stories, right? And and so the tension is high, the you know, the butterflies are going crazy, the you know, the fingernails are being bit all over the place. And and it's just and then as teams start to finish. You know, this sense of relief comes over, you know, groups here or there and they're they're cheering and then but then that also amps up the anxiety mm -hmm. for everyone else who's <laughs> not, right? Yeah. And so in one of these competitions, my one of my strongest students was the was the main editor for our new show. Okay. One of my third three year students like knows her stuff and is just fantastic. What she did though, because of the the you know the crunch and the deadline and because of of the way things you know were at that moment, she just kind of panicked out in those last, you know, in that last hour. And wow. so I think we were like maybe 15 minutes to the deadline. Our show wasn't done yet. And and she was like, okay, we're 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 done. Now we just gotta export, right? And so what she did was she exported what she thought was the show. And as soon as it was done, threw it on a flash drive, didn't look at it, and just ran it in to to get it, you know, turned in on time to make that deadline. Oh wow! 
And and we thought, oh, okay, we made the deadline. Yay, we're cheering, you know, happy. And then she came back to the table and then looked at the file. Oh. Um, and realized that, you know, in Final Cut, if you highlight, if you have one clip highlighted and you share, it only shares that clip. Right. And so she basically shared like eight seconds of oh. one of the clips of one of, of talking you know, of our whole entire show that we spent all day working on, wow. you know, where we had multiple teams that had to go out into the city and talk to people that they didn't know. We all came to, you know, we're, all all the kids were all looking at her and, and, you know, we realized what had happened and she just broke down and uh-huh. just started crying. And it was just, it was so hard to see, but I knew, you know, hey, it was an accident it she didn't mean to do that but she just rushed it didn't really you know check her work before she turned it in and just wanted to make that deadline and so you know there were tears she wasn't the only one that was crying we had lots of other students that are crying because they knew they 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 you know any chance of of winning or even placing was gone because they had submitted eight seconds you know versus the whole eight minutes and so you know we had to i had to you know, we had to debrief when the when that was done, and so we pulled. I pulled them aside, and then we sat down in a corner of, of one of the ballrooms or one of the lobbies, and we just sat and talked about it. And and you know, I said, "Look, this is this is day one of our whole entire competition, but you can't let this define you. You know, hey, it's one day. We need to like." You know, if I had known Ted Lasso back then, I would have said, hey, make like a goldfish and <laughs> yes. just you know, yes. just move on, right? Mm-hmm. But that's exactly what we had to do. We had to let this go because there was nothing that we could do about it. It was not intentional. Anybody could have made that mistake. And so, you know, we said, look, tomorrow, next day of competition, we just got to go out there and do our best. Don't forget about this. Let it go. There's nothing we can do. Let's just move ahead, right? And so... We took that time, we we processed it, we cried, we, you know, let that stuff all out, and then we forgave and then we just move on and we wow. moved on. And and the coolest thing of that whole story, that wasn't it. The the coolest thing was that particular student uh, was in her individual competition and she was with two other students and they were doing an anchoring competition. So they had to take copy. That was given to them, rewrite it, and then produce a 45 second, you know, stand up with mm-hmm. two of them sharing that info. And um, they ended up winning first place wow. in their in their in their category. And the thing that was even more crazy was that I had not known that they almost didn't finish that story as well, or that that entry as well. They were they were struggling with the writing. They were struggling with coming up with how to how to say it. They were she was making the same girl was making all these mistakes, and I had I had no idea because when you know I was busy doing STN things and and at the end of the day I was like, did you guys make your deadline? They said yes. I said okay, good. I don't need to know anything else. You know, I had no idea right. that they were struggling. This girl broke down and cried, and the team came together and just hugged it out. They they mm-hmm. took a moment, hugged each other, supported one another compose themselves they knocked out their their uh entry in the next take made the deadline by a few minutes and then won first place wow. and it was just like holy smokes you know wow. and i didn't even know about that story until i watched aloha atlanta right because the photographer who was tr- you know following them had captured all of that stuff and i had not even known about it. They didn't say anything to me about how how tough it was. They didn't tell me how they almost missed the deadline. They didn't tell me how they broke down. Right. <laughs> Nothing came out until until we watched it. And I and it just made me like appreciate that even more. Like holy yeah. cow, you guys are amazing. Well we did make our deadline and we had maybe a minute or two to spare. And it's crazy because there's a whole lot of students just standing in line to turn in their video. So they had to like push people away and say that, okay, yes, you made the deadline, you have to go on the side to celebrate and stuff. So yeah, it was good that we made the deadline.
That's a great story, Kevin. And, and for our listeners, if you if you want to see Aloha Atlanta again, you can go into the show notes and click on the link, or you can just Google Aloha Atlanta PBS Hawaii, and it will pop up on either PBS's site or YouTube. Um, and I really encourage people to watch the film. To me, it's one of the yeah. greatest 30 minutes of film I've ever seen. Chicken um, skin all the way. Chicken skin all the way. That's yeah. great. So, so Kevin, um, any podcaster would think that this is the right moment to end this conversation, but I'm not going to because I have one more thing <laughs> that I want to cover with you. So um, okay. I want to close today not talking about you and your work, but about two people you respect and admire. Let's call this our shout out moment. So, um, Kevin, who are Candy Suiso and John Allen III? And what is their combined influence on our education community here in Hawaii? You know, it's it's funny you said that because when you brought up, you know, two people, I thought you were gonna have me think about two people, and those are the two people that I thought of. Beautiful. And so <laughs> for for you to also say that, I'm like, hands down, those are two of the most influential people that that have helped shape my my media, you know, teaching career. So Candy and John. Uh, Candy is the is the director. She's the she's one of the founders of Sea Rider Productions in YNI at YNI High School. And um, I had got to know Candy from a technology conference that the DOE used to put out every year. There was like a you know teaching technology conference, and my students uh, had actually won a international or national contest uh, creating a website called ThinkQuest uh, for this, for this, it was a huge contest and we had entered it and we had placed second. We had developed, my students had developed a, you know, a, a surfing website and they made it like a choose your own adventure kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so we had won. And so they invited me to, to, you know, have a booth and then share about this ThinkQuest program and, and, and all of that stuff. So I'm in this booth and across of me is, you know, Candy and her students and they have TVs and they have, you know, VCRs and they're playing this amazing content and I'm sitting across and I'm going holy cow <laughs> like who are these who are these people right mm -hmm. and so I, I I strike up a conversation with Candy and I'm like you know what what's this all about and she shares the program and and it just stuck with me right and so in we fast forward to like you know 1999 and I was getting ready to move back home to Kauai to help open up our, our middle school. And I had gotten the word from my principal that just hired me that, hey, you got to do morning announcements. And mm -hmm. so I thought back, who can I get to help me, you know, figure out how to, how to create this program? And Candy was the first person I thought of. So I contacted her. And, you know, asked her for if I could come out. I went out to, to Waianae, I think, uh, just to kind of talk story with them for a little bit. She she pointed me in the direction of some other people and I got what I needed. And then when I started my program, I continued that relationship with her when they created their very first digital media camp. And I, and I took two students to that camp uh, during the summer one of them who became a teacher. She's teaching at Waipahu High School oh, right now, which that's is pretty fantastic. cool. Yeah. But um, yeah, we went to that camp and they gave me this, you know, this handbook sort of like with all these lessons and that became my textbook for my media class. And that, when I, I brought that back and I followed that, that handbook and those lessons religiously and, and that really upped the game for our students. I mean, you know, finally I had something that I could turn to that, that, you know, I could look to as, you know, quality work. Mm -hmm. And so we, we just molded our program after Sea Rider Productions. And I, be, and then I became, you know, at that camp, I became friends with John. He's, he's now one of my, you know, closest friends. And, you know, the two of them, uh, they have 1000% uh, shaped my, my teaching career, teaching digital media. And mm -hmm. uh, without them, no way would, would any of the stuff that we talked about today have ever happened because they were nice enough. Candy was so nice to just share everything she had. John shared everything he had that I just was like, you know, I got to do the same. And so, you know, anybody that, that came to me, you know, since we started, you know, having some success, I did the same thing for them. I, I shared and opened up and, and helped them as much as I could to kind of like, 
pay it back, you know, to, to everything yeah. that John and Candy did for me. I wanted to do that for other people as well. So yeah, yeah, those two amazing human beings. For sure. Yeah, for sure. I, f- I feel the same way. I had the privilege when I was working on my second documentary film in partnership with Sea Rider Productions. It's called the Innovation Playlist to because of COVID. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, the, the pandemic, work with John. yeah, I got to actually, you know, work with him over zoom and edit the film together. And I will always consider that as one of the highlights of my life is just going through that process with him and just how unbelievably creative he is. Do you know, we actually shot something for that, for, for the film. I found out later, <laughs> just like you found out yeah. in Aloha Atlanta that your student had done it. I found yeah. out later that you guys, that John had reached out to you. Um, and that we yep, needed to get yep. a couple of shots at Waimea Canyon Middle, right? So, yeah, yeah, that's super awesome, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah. So, Kevin Matsunaga, thank you for this time today. I hope you and your family remain safe and in good health. Thank you for all you do to bring student-driven learning to your community. And thank you for all your work over the years. It's been a real treat to have you on the podcast today. Well, thank you so much. It's just, it's, it's never something that I've done alone. It's always been through the help of, you know, different people, colleagues and friends and, and just, you know, support of awesome parents and students. And um, yeah, it's been total group process and, yep. and, and, and collective process to, to work with all these amazing people. And I can't take you know, sole responsibility for it. But thank you. I appreciate those kind words. It's all about teamwork, meeting deadlines and communicating clearly, right? Exactly. Uh, That is like the secrets of life right there. It's where we started and that's where we're ending. That's great. So thank you, Kevin. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Mahalo. My editor, creative consultant and sound engineer is the talented Evan Kurohara. Our theme music comes from the vast catalog of music created by my friend of 40 years, the remarkable pianist Michael Sloan. Producer of 12 albums with over 100 songs, Michael Sloan is featured in Apple Music, Spotify, and all the other major music platforms. You can also find his work at his YouTube channel. Michael has listeners in over 100 countries and over 2,000 cities to date. Support these episodes with remarkable, innovative, and imaginative educators and education leaders by giving us your own rating and writing us a review at your favorite podcast store. This series is funded by education change agent Ted Dintersmith, executive producer of the acclaimed documentary film Most Likely to Succeed, and author of the best-selling book What School Could Be. Please join the What School Could Be virtual community by going to community dot what school could be dot org or by downloading the what school could be app from your favorite app store the what school could be in hawaii podcast is brought to you by josh rapoon productions send your feedback to mlts in hawaii at gmail.com and follow us on twitter at mlts in hawaii and at josh rapoon finally please like our most likely to succeed in hawaii facebook page and youtube channel Friends, even as COVID infection numbers decline, stay safe, wear a mask in public places, and please get vaccinated. Most of all, bring kindness and compassion into the world. We need a surplus of both right now. Until the next episode, ahui ho and take care.